Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speakers are Andrew Harvey, Daniel Adoko, Samuel Obeng Mensa, Enok Mensa Opoku, Yunis Opoku, and Samuel Lerti. Andrew is a junior professor for African Languages and the Construction of Knowledge in the Faculty of Languages and Literatures at the University of Bayreuth. His interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evidenced through the linguistic arts and language contact. Beginning with work on Gorwa and expanding to Ehanzu and Hatsa, Andrew's work engages with the complex language situation present in central Tanzania's Rift Valley, where languages of all four of Greenberg's African language phyla are spoken and have been spoken for some time. His research foci include language contact and morphin syntax, with the understanding that any linguistic insight must be tied to a community-driven documentary record, combining and celebrating the languages, cultures, and histories of the speaker communities involved. Please join me in welcoming Andrew and his co-authors as he presents their talk, Kinship Terms in the Tanzanian Rift, Initial Observations. Thank you, Anna, for the uh, introduction. I'm here with a subset of the participants in uh, the University of Bayreuth course here today, and uh, most of our co-authors. So uh, not here alone, but with uh, with the others who, uh, who put it together. Uh, so welcome to our talk, uh, Kinship Terms in the Tanzanian Rift, Initial Observations. Uh, so which I'm presenting together with uh, Daniel Adoko, Samuel Ben Mensa. Enoch Menzo Poku, uh, Eunice Poku, and Samuel Larti. Um, so Tanzania's Rift Valley has been shown to feature linguistic diversity punctuated by remarkable convergences. And so this talk is a first effort as extending that analysis to the words people use to refer to their relatives. Uh, this talk will begin with a few words about the larger context in which this project took place, and we'll then move to an introduction to kinship and some of the visual shorthand we'll be employing throughout this talk. And following a brief note on the data used in this talk, we'll then present what we know about the kinship systems and kinship terminology of the Tanzanian Rift. Next, we'll go into some further detail on the kinship systems of the Tanzanian Rift by way of three initial investigations. The first being the structure of sibling and cousin relations, the second being the relations which we might refer to as in-laws, and the third being the relation of the mother's brother. And we end by mentioning further prospects. By way of context, this talk is, pro is a product of the University of Bayreuth course Languages and Meaning part of which was dedicated to kinship and kinship terminology across the African continent. Participants surveyed both lexical and ethnographic material from language communities across Africa, bringing together a wealth of, of material, both lexical, so kinship terms, and material of a structural nature, that is kinship systems. This talk mobilizes this cross-continent data by employing it as a background against which languages of the Tanzanian Rift can be compared and contrasted, with the goal of asking questions about whether kinship terms and systems have been genetically inherited, affected by contact, or innovated in response to wider historical and social factors. Throughout this talk, we'll be making extensive, extensive use of this chart, uh, where triangles indicate males and circles indicate females. Equals signs denote a marriage relationship between two individuals. The white association lines which connect individuals on the chart can be traced to various relations. The one highlighted in red here marks one between an individual and his two parents and his brother and his sister. So what we would consider like a nuclear family relationship. The letters and letter combinations represent conventionalized notations for various relatives. The combination BW, for example, means brother's wife. And the combination FZH means father's sister's husband. The filled shape marked ego, here highlighted in red, 
indicates the self. That is the individual by which all other relationships in the chart are reckoned. As a quick example in practice, let's take Igbo. In Igbo, we can see that one's father's sister is referred to as Nwana, and one's mother's sister is called Neuku. We could indicate that the two terms are different by marking FZ does not equal MZ. At the same time, one's father's sister's daughter, one's father's sister's son, one's sister's daughter, and one's sister's son all share the same name, Okere. As such, that equivalence can be represented as FZS equals FZD equals ZS equals ZD. In addition to this chart, which represents primarily blood relations, that is, consanguinal relations, we will also occasionally refer to this chart, which refers to relations by marriage, affinal relations. Take Akon, for example, where one's wife's father and one's wife's mother are referred to by the same word. This can be represented by the shorthand WF equals WM. Similarly, one's wife, one's wife's brother's sister, and one's wife's sister are all referred to by the same name. This can be represented by writing W equals W B Z W equals W Z. Moving from notational conventions, I'd like now to talk a bit about the data we'll be using. Again, this talk will focus on the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, of which we will be using data from Gisanjanga de Toga. Gorwa, Hadza, Ihanzu, Mbugwe, Nyaturu, Nilamba, Sandawe, and as a so-called marginal member, Sukuma. Patterns we see in this data will then be compared and contrasted with data from approximately 50 other languages from across the African continent with the aim of identifying patterns beyond the rift. On the map, languages marked with a circle are from the so-called Niger-Congo phylum, Languages marked with a square are from the Afroasiatic phylum. Languages marked with a diamond are from the so-called Ni Nilo-Saharan phylum. Languages marked with a star are from the group of language families grouped together as the non-genetic entity Khoisan. And languages marked by a point are isolates. In terms of the data, the materials we use range from dedicated publications, such as this detailed account of Hadza kinship terminology by Kirk Miller, to field notes, such as this diagram, which came from a session I conducted on Ihanzu kinship terms. Overall, and my co-authors will concur with me on this, no doubt, the data available on kinship terms and kinship systems across the continent is, despite its long history, rather poor. This has to do often with vague definitions, terms written by non-linguists, etc. To access this talk itself, it will be archived on Zenodo with its own DOI, as well uh, as available on the Rift Valley Network's YouTube account, which can be accessed following the QR code on screen. What follows now is a brief presentation on the data we have collected thus far on the Tanzanian Rift languages of our sample. We'll start with Hadza because in many cases, the kinship system is the most straightforward. Many male relations are referred to by a certain term and their female counterparts are referred to by the same term, but with the common feminine marker ko. In many cases, Hadza employs one term consistently for members of a given generation. Members of one own, one's own generation are, for example, Moluna. And members of one's children's generation are wa'a. The same principle applies to relations of marriage. One notable exception to this rule is the name of the mother's brother, Akae, which is the same as the name for one's grandfather. We'll return to this avuncular wrinkle later. Note that the data for Ihanzu are considerably less complete. With that said, I find it interesting that the consultant I work with was able to name most of the relatives on his mother's side uh, and his sister's side, but none on his father's side. I see this as an interesting reflection of the relative importance of the mother's side of the family in what has been described as a matrilineal society. 
Note that the term munyakumba for wife's brother and wife's sister. We will return to this in a bit. The Nyulamba material is rather more complete, but features another challenge. That being the presence of a wealth of what might be borrowings from Swahili. Because both are Bantu languages, however, it is difficult at first flush to decide what might be a borrowing and what might just be a shared term. I include the affinal relations for completeness. Nyaturu's system seems rather less characterized by Swahili borrowings, and here is the affinal terms we currently have. Sukuma, characterized as a marginal member of the Tanzanian Rift by Kiesling Mouse and Nurse 2008, is presented here. The data is incomplete, and by many means, some of the terms identified seem rather surprising or strange. Affinal relations are given here. The Rangi data is interesting in that we often have pairs of terms, one of which seems Swahili in origin, and the other which seems less Swahili and therefore presumably more Rangi in origin. And here are the Athenal terms. Data from Mbugwe is interesting to me in how different it is from the Rangi, which is surprising given how closely the Mbugwe and Rangi languages are said to be related genetically. The same observation can also be said to apply for Ihanzu, Nyulamba, and Nyaturu, three closely related Bantu languages whose kinship systems feature what appear to be rather different lexical terms. And here is Mbugwe's set of ethnal relations. Gorwa will be the language used to represent Southern Cushitic in this sample. I can say with confidence that the system is essentially the same as that of Iraq, though I'm less confident when comparing with Alagua and Burungay. And here is the ethnal kinchart. The set of terms from the Southern Nilotic language Gisamjanga de Toga are notable in the widespread presence of multi-word analytic forms. For example, one's mother's sister's daughter is literally the daughter of the daughter of your maternal grandmother. This pattern is seen sometimes in other languages of the Rift sample, but nowhere near as commonly as in Gisamjanga de Toga. The Athenal chart is given here, with the only terms collected the ones for husband's father and husband's mother. Finally, the Sandawe data is given here, along with the Athenal terms here. In the preceding section, we briefly presented the kinship terminology of nine languages of the Tanzanian Rift. What follows is a deeper look at three subsystems present in those larger holes. We will start with the terms for siblings and the rather nebulous English term cousins. We will then look at in-law relations, and we will finish with an examination of the mother's brother and some relevant associations. Regarding siblings and cousins, the relationships that we will be examining include the brother and sister, that's rather straightforward, as well as of the children of one's father's and, one mo and one's mother's siblings, the so-called first cousin relationships of English. Hadza basically recognizes no distinction among siblings and cousins, except for differentiating gender by a gender suffix. Gisimjanga de Toga, on the other hand, through its analytical system of kinship naming, fully differentiates each of these relationships. The Gorwa system falls a bit closer to minimal differentiation, using two different lexical items differentiating gender of the relation. Essentially, one's brother and male cousins are hia, and one's sister and female cousins are heu. The mother's sister's children are an exception and are both referred to as Daumo. The data we have so far shows the Sandawe system falls a bit closer to maximal differentiations with terms for sibling differentiated by gender and a separate term for the children of one's mother's brother marked for gender with the Sandawe gender markers. 
For the Bantu languages, there is no distinction in the term used for one's brother and one's sister in both Ihanzu as well as in Mbugwe, though there is a sex-based distinction in the term for sibling in Rangi, in Nyilamba, and in Sukuma. In Nyaturu, we cannot tell, as there is a gap in the data here. Nyaturu, on the other hand, does give us a good set of data on the terms for cousins, where we see an interesting pattern. That is, the children of one's father's sister and the children of one's mother's brother are referred to by the same term, daya. While the children of one's father's brother and the children of one's mother's sister are referred to by what seems to be a different set of terms. In fact, this seems to be inherited from an older system called Proto-East Bantu in an article by Mark and Bastun, which is characterized therein by an important differ differentiation between cross-cousins, that is, children of one's father's sister and one's mother's brother, versus one's parallel cousins, that is, the children of one's father's brother and one's mother's sister. Essentially, it is posited that one could marry one's cross cousins, whereas one's parallel cousins were unmarriageable. Traces of this system possibly obtain in both Rangi and Nyulamba, whereas in Ihanzu and in Sukuma, gaps in the data mean that we simply cannot tell. Mbugwe shows a different pattern with the children of the mother's brother given a special name and all other cousins given the same name. And we'll talk more about this later. Moving now to an examination of in-laws, we must first recognize that this term is also rather imprecise, referring not only to one's brother's wife and one's sister's husband, but also to all of one's spouse's family. There are a lot of patterns we could examine here, but in the interest of time, we'll focus only on a couple. First, note that in Ihanzu, the word for one's sibling's spouse is the same. This is also the case for one's spouse's siblings. The same pattern obtains in Sukuma, where the term is Ikuela. The pattern in Gorwa is different, where there's a different term for one's brother's wife and one's sister's husband. Further, the same in equivalence also applies for terms for one's wife's brother and one's wife's sister. Note, however, that while the terms of one's brother's wife and one's wife's brother and one's sister's husband and one's wife's brother are not the same, the terms for one's brother's wife and one's wife's sister as well as one's sister's husband and one's wife's brother, are the same. Essentially, kumba is the term used in Gorwa to refer to any male in-law of your rough age, and mange is used to refer to any female in-law of your rough age. Note, however, that this only applies if the ego is male. If the ego is female, a slightly different set of terms applies. So whether this pattern exists in other languages of the rift is uncertain. We don't really know. We don't have good enough data to tell. Moving on to another detail and staying with Gorwa for now, note the term mange. If the ego is male, it, it is the term used for one's brother's wife, as well as one's wife's sister. And if the ego is, fem is female, mange is used for one sister's husband. The term always stood out to me as a potential borrowing from a Bantu language. The word high final tone on a noun, as well as the pre-nasalized velar stop, were particular cues. And indeed, if we look at Rangi, we can see a candidate in the form manga, here in the chart with a possessive suffix. Note, however, an even better potential cognate in Mbugwe, where Mange is the wife's brother if the ego is male, and the husband's sister if the ego is female. 
Returning once again to Gorwa, the term kumba with its word high, word final high tone, as well as its prenasalized bilabial stop, is similarly suspect of being a Bantu loan. Here, the term is used to refer to one's sister's husband, where the ego is male, as well as one's wife's brother, again, if the ego is male. Indeed, we see this form in Ihanzu as Munya Kumba, where the Munya prefix is more or less indicating a relation of possession or close association. With that said, it's nowhere else in any of the other Bantu languages we have data for. So at any rate, it speaks to perhaps a closer tie between R West Rift uh, and Ihanzu versus the other F group languages than we had previously thought. We have shreds of evidence for this already. So for example, the Rainmaker clans, both of the Ihanzu and the Gorwa people trace their lineage to Ihanzu people. But this is one more piece of tantalizing evidence. Finally, I would like now to take a close look at the relation of the mother's brother. At first glance, this may seem rather less interesting than the other relations given so far. After all, it is only one relationship, whereas siblings and cousins and in-laws, which we examined a second ago, were rather wider concepts. But as we go deeper, however, a rather larger and perhaps very significant pattern emerges. Several languages of the Tanzanian Rift have a special term used to refer to the mother's brother. Beginning again with Gorwa, the term used is Mamai. In Sandawe, it is Mame. In Gisamjanga de Toga, we'll note that um, it's, rep it's been represented rather weakly in any discussion uh, of shared lexical material. The term uh, for mother's brother is Mamai. In Ihanzu, the term is Mami. And when mapped, we have a nice cluster uh, represented uh, when we map the rift languages. In fact, if we zoom out, terms for the mother's brother using a similar form are widespread across Eastern Africa. Manfredi, in a work that focuses on the languages of the Nuba Mountains, notes that it has already been established that other scholars, uh, by other scholars, that the Nilo-Saharan root mama is widespread in both Nilo-Saharan and Niger-Congo, referring to the mother's brother. But what is striking here is that it seems that if it seems as if forms in the rift are not from Nilo-Saharan in any straightforward sense. That is, the form in Datoga could be argued to be a borrowing, and Maasai lacks this form altogether. Um, a second etymological note on the mother's brother relation comes again from Proto-East Bantu, where the form uh, with the form Madume, uh, literally male mother, is reconstructed. While this is probably the origin of the Sukuma word for mother's brother, which I find rather strange uh, as a Bantu form, um, I feel like the connection between this form and Mamai, or between this form and any other Mamai-like forms discussed here, is improbable. As for some attempt at an explanation here, this relationship is somehow salient. We have stories from the Mara region of migrating Nilotic peoples relying on their mother's brother's households as places of refuge during conflict or other hardship, a sort of rear guard for a group of people expanding into a new territory. Essentially, what the mother's brother represents is the head of the matriline, uh, especially upon the passing of the wife's father. And this is where a second, more subtle pattern emerges. In many languages that do not employ mamai or a sim similar form for the mother's brother, they do employ the same term for the mother's brother and the mother's father. This is what we see in Yaturu, where the term koku is used. Note especially that this special overlap only applies to the mother's brother and not father's brother. This is also the case in Rangi as well as in Hadza, Miller noting that it is basically the only exception to a system which gives a consistent name to everyone of the same generation. I hypothesize that there's even more at play here, though. I have several recordings uh, on 
uh, the role of the maternal uncle in Gorwa society, but have yet to analyze these. So as such, what I mention now has to remain speculation. But I have been told several times in an anecdotal fashion that if the mother's brother passes away, you will inherit his property, including his wife and children if they are still young. It should be noted that leveret unions, the inheritance of a deceased brother's property and stewardship of his wife and children through a special type of marriage, is common in many parts of the African continent and the wider world. But what stands out here uh, is that it is not the inheritance of a brother's wife, but of one's mother's brother's wife. We can see traces of this institution in a couple of distinct patterns in other languages. And again, the existence of this institution must uh, remain a hypothesis, but I think that the data for it is compelling. The first is that in Mbugwe, the children of one's mother's brother have a different name in comparison to all other cousin terms, which perhaps indicates a special kind of relation and a special set of obligations to these children versus others. The second pattern is in Rangi, where one of the terms used to refer to your mother's brother, Mujomba, is the same as one of the terms refer, used to refer to your sister's children. This is because to the children of your sister, you are their mother's brother, thus representing a continuous chain of matrilineal power across three generations. Finally, in Sandawe, the pattern is the same as Rangi, but even more striking in that your mother's brother and your sister's children say, share the same term, and that term is Mame. I'll start this conclusion with an apology and then a promise. So the apology is that originally this talk was conceived as including considerably more cross-continent comparison. However, once we began encountering the details and intricacies of the patterns present in the Tanzanian Rift, it became clear that this would have to form the central focus of the talk before any wider comparison could be drawn. As such, the promise will be that this talk will eventually be followed with more with a more systematic cross-continent comparison, both of individual kinship terms as well as kinship systems. So please stay tuned for this. Um, further, I'd like to talk about this idea that a promising prospect exists in the improvement of the empirical base of kinship terms. So the data as presented was incomplete and may very well, due to its nature, contain errors. We know, for example, that Bantu terms for siblings are often sensitive to whether they are older or younger than the ego. Uh, so we can see this in Swahili. Uh, the word for older sister is dada, the word for older brother is kaka, and all younger siblings are referred to as mdogo, whether they are female or male. So this distinction was either left out of this talk or not discernible from the data. The actual dynamics of kinships, uh, of kinship and kinship systems uh, that these words sort of merely hint at are also extremely understudied. And possible areas to look at include uh, things like wedding ceremonies, who gets what in bride price uh, division, funeral ceremonies, so uh, the idea of inheritance, uh, who conducts funeral ceremonies and who receives uh, what in terms of inheritance as well as uh, relationships of joking and relationships of respect. All of these patterns uh, would help us understand dynamics of kinship and kinship systems in the Tanzanian Rift uh, with a clearer focus. Uh, before I finally conclude, I'd like to thank a handful of people. So Martin Mouse and Georgia Zante generously shared uh, their collected research materials, including original field notes and analysis on the kinship terms of the languages of the Tanzanian Rift. Bonnie Sands uh, shared several important articles on kinship. Alice Mitchell helped me understand kinship terms in Gisamjanga de Toga, as well as filled out some terms I had not encountered in the existing literature. And uh, Natalia Viet uh, shared a preprint pre of her and Gertrude Schneiderblum's work on kinship in, in Tima. And finally, thanks to all of you for listening. I hope that we can take this topic further. And so I look forward to comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew.
and of course your co-authors for this really interesting presentation. So we can start the question and answer section. Um, I think I'll start with a question of my own. Um, maybe I missed it, but um, first a clarification. So for the terms when it comes to the mother's brother, does this only apply if the ego is male? Or would it also apply if the ego is female? So this is a bit of an unclarity that exists throughout sort of the way that everything has been um, prepared. Um, so uh, generally, uh, I haven't, well, when I've been presenting, I haven't presented, um, I haven't presented sort of both options, whether the, the ego is female and whether the ego is male. Sometimes I have when I really knew, like in Gorwa, for example, but most of the other languages, we just don't have that data. So we open up a word list or we open up a dictionary and we receive a form like maternal uncle or mother's brother. Mm -hmm. And there's no indication as to whether that's male or female. So um, by a default, and this is probably sexist of me for doing that, I've just I've just left it at, as male. I assume that the term is probably the same, but I don't know. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more question was just a curiosity. So in a lot of Indo-European languages, like you have, particularly when it comes to siblings, you have a term like siblings, which is a group, and then of course, brother, sister. Mm -hmm. um do you see any pattern like that like do you have any group terms like I've, i already see like some of the terms just apply across a generation so it's obviously already a group but um yeah these these group terms are kind of interesting so like yeah i mean i guess at its core if we look at a term like muluna in um ihanzu for example i'll see if i can don't mind if i jump back i'll see if i can find an example of uh, of ihanzu yeah, so if we look at if we look at Muluna here, I mean, I guess that a a better a better definition here would be sibling, yeah. And then if somebody wants to uh, further define this term Muluna, they'll say something like the female Muluna and the male Muluna, yeah. So it's like my male sibling, my female sibling. So I guess you know, in terms of that, that would be the that would be the term. Um, and just like you mentioned, in other in other languages that we've seen that have sort of even wider terms, uh, you know, I mean, these could probably be be looked at as like this is the term that I use for sibling and cousin. Um, in terms of other words, so a language that might have a fully distinguished set, and then trying to find like a term that refers to all of this, so like the hypernym in Gisamjanga de Toga of your siblings or of your of your cousins. I haven't found that. Um, I know that some of these other group terms exist. So I know that in Iraq, for example, they have a term for all of your all of your relatives on your mother's side, for example. All of your matriline are given a certain term. So that's one sort of group term, but maybe a little bit different from what you might see in Indo-European, for example. Uh, so in terms of like a straightforward answer to your question, I think that looking at some of these terms that we have right now would probably help us arrive at these sort of like larger set terms, rather than looking at it through very sort of um, uh, a very sort of like atomized uh, scale like the chart does here. Um, and then I think, yeah, some of these other terms will come up, but they might be a little bit more specialized, you know or they might be cut differently uh, from what we might expect. Yeah, thank you. I thought it would be interesting because at least when it comes to Indo-European, like siblings is quite gender neutral. In Italian, you always appear to like the male form if you just want to apply to the whole, like, and then in Germany, you have because Western, which comes from the female form. So I was, yeah, just wondering. That's interesting. And um, then I see that Bonnie raised her hand. Hi, thanks for this talk. It's certainly a dizzying amount of data <laughs> and and hard to assimilate all at, at one go. Um, but uh, thank you and your co-authors for putting this all together. Uh, I also was curious about the, you know, the ego being male or female and, you know, how much we stress that, uh, you know, as a language documentation thing that people should be careful to get both. Uh, but my question relates to that Coco term. If you could go back to yeah. this was sort of a male brother, mother brother kind of Coco. Yeah, actually stop on this one. So I remembered that Sandawi does have a term for grandfather that's Coco. 
mm -hmm. as, as you see here. And in uh, I did some uh, field notes on Sandawe kinship terms at one point, and I got the word Thai for grandfather, but specifically only the father's father, which made me think that Coco might have historically specifically only been the mother's father. And it might have had, and uh, maybe Helen can say something here with regards to that. So do you think there's any connection between the Sandawe Coco term and the term that you had in the other languages? I think it was the Gisamjeg. Uh, so to answer your question, and I'll just, uh, I'm going to go up to sort of where I present all of the Rift languages and just do a scroll for, um, a scroll, uh, for illustration here. We can see that like a lot of these languages use a form Koko actually in Hadza, they don't use the form, but we do use the term Goku, which is like fella or friend, right? Uh, you might use that term buddy. Uh, would be Goku. Um, but what we see uh, is that this term is everywhere for grandfather. So we see it in Yilamba, we can see it with Kuoku, uh, we can see it in Yaturu with Kuku, um, Sukuma, we get Goku, which is bizarre, that B at the end, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, we can, we don't see it for Rangi, uh, we don't see it for Mbugwe, we don't have it in Gorwa or Gisamjanga de Toga, uh, but we get it in Sandawe. I expect from what I've seen of um of sample of of our sample of other Bantu languages in Niger Congo, this looks to be a very good, uh, at least narrow Bantu term. And it seems to have been adopted into these other languages. So I expect that the Koko in Sandawe is a borrowing from Bantu. That's my assumption. But my my question is, do you think that this originally was mother's brother, like an uncle term, or it was originally a grandfather term, or you're not? Mm, so I'm not 100% sure, but um, a lot of the time, these um, grandfather, grandmother terms, in Bantu at least, uh, have some sort of notion or have some sort of lexical item that means big in them. So like yeah. your big father or your big mother. Now that form would be Kulu, which is not Koko, but you know, I mean, it's not a massive, it's not a massive stretch. Like even the word Ku, right? You could, mm -hmm. that could be reduplicated to Ku Ku, meaning, you know, really big. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a link there, but I can't really confidently establish one. But um, in terms of like the Rift languages, I'm pretty sure that's a borrowing from Bentu. Okay, we still have to explain the lower vowel in Sandawe. But just a, one more yeah. quick, quick comment, which is that Southern African Khoisan tend to have words for older sibling, older brother versus younger brother. And we don't see that here, anything like that here. Or if it does exist in the rift, we, we just don't have it. Um, it's not properly um, recorded in these charts or it's not properly recorded in the word lists, right? Because we go at it. Um, this is an issue with going at things from sort of like an English language perspective, right? When you do it, you lose all of the uh, all of the shades of meaning uh, that come with uh, that come with kin. I see that Helen left a comment in the chat, which says that she's only ever known Coco for both types of grandfather. She has not come across the other term at all. And she says that Coco different tone is chicken in Sandawi. A nice imitative form, Coco. And then I see Martin has raised his hands. Go ahead. It, the, the Thai word has been uh, documented by Ed Elderkin and also by Kagaya and me. So it's definitely not my imagination, but it may be a direct address kind of term. Ah, okay. So this is, this is another thing, Bonnie, and I'm glad that you brought this up is that I tried as hard as possible to just get sort of the neutral terms. And we can talk about what neutral means maybe later in another conversation. But, but what I mean is I was trying to avoid these address terms like pops or ma or like bro these are all terms that exist. They seem to exist in the Rifali uh, languages, the Tanzanian Rift languages. So for example, Ihanzu, uh, we get a word list that says the word for brother is heu. And I know that that is a term that's used for brother, but it's only when you're actually sort of calling out your brother's name, hey bro kind of thing. 
So I, I didn't put that on this chart. And I tried to avoid most of the other terms that were encoded in dictionary as like uh, brother with an exclamation mark after it. So I tried to avoid those terms in the chart. I also avoided terms that were uh, that seemed like they were lexically different uh, if they were possessed. So I know, for example, that in uh, in Gorwa, for example, the word for mother is slightly different. So there are two slightly different lexical forms, uh, depending on whether you're talking about your mother. So like my mother, a specific mother, or just any mother in general. So uh, we know that this is a, that this is a uh, that this is a popular pattern like these are popular sort of uh, sets across uh, oh we I'll just go back we we get a lot of um we get a lot of terms say for example uh my relation and they would have a special word uh whereas like when you're talking about the individual in general um, you you get a different uh, you get a different kin term. Uh, also in Hadza, I should say, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Kirk Miller writes about a whole entirely different set of kinship terms. If you're saying your relation, mm -hmm. so your mother, your father, your brother, uh, they use entirely different set of terms than the ones listed here. And uh, very often there's uh, there's a lot more borrowing there. And that's a whole other thing. And again, it points at the fact that the data that we have for most of the languages is just not rich enough for us to do a proper comparison. Uh, that Hadza set is really, really interesting. And it forces us to ask questions about what, what does that mean when you're borrowing terms to refer to your mother or your father, and then you're using a whole other set of terms for my uh, father or my mother. That's really interesting, and I wouldn't be surprised uh, to see more patterns like that uh, in the languages of the Rift. But again, we just don't have the data. Yes, thank you, <laughs> Andrew. I have a, a question, and it is a, a question that I have to myself, but maybe <laughs> you, you know the answer. Uh, is that I wonder, um, we see these innovations in uh, in several of the systems, and I, I would like to know, but but I'm struggling with it, which innovations are uh, telling us something about a change in the whole uh, kinship system, and which innovations don't tell us anything apart from that Swedi is now... Um, popular language and the cool language. So you have certain cases where just one term is replaced, one specific term by one specific term. And sometimes you get uh, a term for the mother's brother as a new one. Uh, but then I wonder, does that show then that the mother's brother has become more prominent or that they just uh, learn to differentiate that and it's still the same as the the mother's father in the, in the importance do you have any thoughts on it uh i have a couple thoughts on this so first of all the idea of the significance of innovating a term and this kind of gets at the heart of this words and things approaches right so somebody who sort of espoused this idea that if you have a specific word for something, it, you know, if we don't know otherwise, we might be able to come up with a historical situation in which A, that thing existed, if you had a word for it, a special word for it, or B, that was somehow important uh, to the people who use the language. Um, I, I feel like that's not necessarily the case. Uh, but uh, for for all you know for all words and things sort of approaches but um in this case i mean the jury is still out it's very true that when the word is innovated um it certainly exists in an environment in which there seems to be other evidence like what we're looking at right now for hadza that somehow there's something special going on for example with the mother's brother even when there's no innovation of a lexical item we are getting an interesting synonymy here. And what does that tell us about the system in general? I know that in Kirk's article, he talks about the fact that originally this was uh, this was described as being sort of uh, 
a result of uh, of the influence of lever unions, for example, so the marriage of uh, of a deceased relative's uh, wife uh, to uh, to a brother, or in this case, it would be to to um, a a nephew. Um, uh, but then he sort of describes the fact that leveret unions of any kind don't really seem super popular in Hadza. Um, so you know, okay, so what's the what's the use of this uh, of this lexical item? Is it sort of pointing to uh, a, a, a dynamic in the kinship system that we haven't really looked at fully, or is it simply just the effect of contact from from outside languages that did a similar thing? And was this just simply an adoption? Um, we don't know. And again, I think more work needs to be done uh, on uh, more work needs to be done on the actual dynamics before we can say whether this is important. And of course, what's exciting is that in most cases, we still can look at these dynamics. They still are, you know, living practices in terms of weddings and funerals and joking relations. So, I mean, that all remains uh, remains very rich and in many ways sort of a rich language uh, source. Um, in terms of another way that we can approach this, was this innovation sort of a meaningful one in response to social change? I think that this is sort of where the promissory note um, at the end of the talk goes, is that I think it would be interesting now to look a little bit further outside of the rift, a bit like what we did for that map of East Africa in general, uh, but to look a little bit more in depth on these patterns as they exist outside of um, outside of the rift, and to see if we have more patterns, and to see where they where they don't exist. So I was quite surprised when we started looking at nilotic terms or nilotic languages close to the Tanzania Kenya border, uh, including Pokot, for example, which wasn't shown on the uh, on the chart. We don't get a term for mamai. Uh, we don't get a mamai term for the mother's brother, and uh, we don't, in any straightforward way, get any sort of indication that the mother's brother was was an important institution uh, in Pokot. Uh, we don't get it in Maasai. Uh, so, if we assume that the that the word mamai is is nilotic in some sort of very deep sense, uh, we certainly don't see that immediately on the border of uh, of Tanzania and Kenya. So, how do we go further up? We need to start looking at more languages in. Uh, in Kenya and uh, Uganda, and I would expect uh, Southern Sudan as well. It's just, you know, we have gaps in the map. Uh, I don't know if that responds to your question at all. It does, thank you. I have a question, um, although I was, it was a bit of a fire hose uh, for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my question has to be very simple, but uh, you know, you're trying to make a linguistic connection um, are there any other are there cultural practices that might account for I mean, it? It's clearly cultural um, relationships and practices and, you know, something. So uh, if it's not shared with Nilotic people, people that you're right across the border, at least in that particular area, um, what might be the similar um, practices that could account for that? This oh, Sorry, with partic in particular with the the. Um, the uh mother's 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 brother brother yeah position um so thank you for this question hope i mean the idea of the mother's brother if you boil it down it seems to be that they are just like the biggest sort of most able man on your mother's side so they're kind of like the center of your mother's side of the family. Let's mm -hmm. just say that because you would assume that at this stage, your mother's father is kind of getting old, he may be deceased, etc. So really it's your mother's brother who's kind of the, the most powerful, the, the person who makes the decisions on your mother's side. Now, when people think of, of a matrilineal society, they often think, okay, this is a society in which the women make the make the choices right because the you know the identity goes down through the mother's side but actually it's it's usually men within that structure that are the ones who hold the power so when we talk about matrilineal societies let's not get it twisted and think that these are societies in which the women necessarily have all the power sometimes uh, they will have certain power but often it is crystallized in inside of the the men often the mothers brothers 
Um, so if that is sort of what this mother's brother relationship represents, then we need to sort of think about the wider implications of the utility of your of your mother's side of the family in, you know, in sort of modern history, but also moving back further and further. So we have uh, Jan Bender Shetler writing about essentially Luo people moving into Mara, mm -hmm. uh, where it was already populated. And a lot of these uh, historical narratives say, okay, you know, when things get hard for us, we return to our mother's uh, brother or our mother's family. And what that means is if you are in a, uh, if you're in an expanding society, what often happens is as, as a male, you will go off, you will leave your family behind either to clear land or either to rustle cattle. So often these sort of expansion societies moving into places that are either empty, that have forests that needs to be cleared and grassland that needs to be continuously burnt, at least at the beginning, or they have places where cattle can be rustled. These are often groups of men or groups of, you know, groups of people that are sort of uh, centered around a sort of a small family. So when something, when something goes wrong, uh, you leave that area. So if you're, if you, you encounter people who are maybe hostile, or if you encounter cattle disease, or if you encounter a bad harvest, when you leave, what you do is you return to your mother's family because they're the ones who are settled. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are settled in one place. So you know where they're, you know where they're going to be and they're going to be more established. So in that sense, sort of the mother's side of the family represents kind of a, uh, uh, an insurance policy if your expansion is, uh, is risky. And then, so then they talk about this. Uh, so, so that's sort of from, from, from a general perspective, but they also talk about innovation that occurs on the mother's brother's side from, uh, from a Bantu perspective in Uganda. And what we have here is uh, a case in which the peoples who, uh, who um, preceded the uh, Baganda and the Banyoro and one other group of people um, sort of innovated this idea of the, um, of the mother's brother as being sort of an important institution uh, that counterbalanced uh, this development of essentially what was a feudal system on the shores of Northwest Lake Victoria. We had the cases where societies were beginning to settle more. And um, if we look at if we look at Mark and Bostoon, what they what they posit is as societies settle more, they become more patrilineal in orientation. But uh, in the uh, Northwest uh, Lake Victoria example, this idea of the mother's brother as an institution was changed and was developed. So there's a whole bunch of terms up in that area for the mother's brother um, that are slightly different again, uh, but represented a different sort of conception of what the mother's brother is. And I'm happy that Bonnie shared that um, book uh, because again, it's a really in-depth uh, look at exactly this, um, exactly this dynamic. I have it here on my desk somewhere uh, and that's the exact go-to place for, uh, for this. So in so many words, Great. I don't know if that significantly answered your question or not, but that's oh, sort of thoughts. beautiful. Yeah, no, thank you. That's really lovely. Um, did you look at Luo then? You uh, said Pocot, but... Luo, I looked at Pocot. We had some stuff on Luo, but we didn't have any ethnographic stuff, or at least mm -hmm. I didn't read any ethnographic stuff. We did have a word list from one of our co-authors, though, mm -hmm. uh, who broke it down. Okay. But again, nothing Very nothing jumped out to me. Nothing jumped out to me for, for mother's brother there, like lexically. Hmm. You know? Okay. Hmm. Neat. Thank you. That was very interesting. And if there's no further questions, then I think I'll close the session for today. Um, so thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the bibliography. Um, so for the next few weeks, we're going to be in a short summer break and the webinars will be recommencing on the 6th of September with a presentation by Husna Mashaka. Um, so I would like to thank Andrew and his co-authors again for their presentation, everyone else for participating today. I wish you all a good summer and I hope to see you again at our next